protocols to be observed. From then on, we will be shouting all protocols observed. It will be very easy for us. Thank you, Doc. Good morning, uh, everybody. So let me acknowledge uh, Professor Jimabwedi, uh, board chair of Afrobarometer. The Africa Governance Architecture Organs uh, representatives who are here and uh, welcome to uh, Accra. Our Data for Governance Alliance consortium members also welcome. Our CSO partners gathered here. Um, the members of the uh, the staff of the Secretariat of the West Africa Democracy Solidarity Network, WADIMOS, uh, our media friends and ladies and gentlemen. Let me wish you a very good morning uh, on behalf of the Data for Governance Alliance, D4GA uh, for short, and on behalf of the board and the management and staff of CDD Ghana. Uh, I welcome you to this very important uh, five-day multi-stakeholder convening on governance, democracy, and human rights in Africa. This program being held from today to Friday, September 23rd, 2022, will focus on enhancing capacity of Pan-African CSOs in the use of data to guide their advocacy and policy engagement activities. It would also create the platform for CSOs to meet with representatives from the five AU organs and interact with them on their core mandates and how CSOs can contribute to popularize their work to African citizens. Now, this is the first of three convenings planned for 2022. The second convening will take place in Cape Town in South Africa from October 3rd to the 7th, and the final one will be held in Nairobi from October 17th to the 21st. Now, why the uh, Data for Governance Alliance and our objectives? Now, over the decades, progress in de democracy, good governance, and respect for human rights across Africa has been halting at best, and as reported by the Afrobarometer, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, Freedom House, and others, there are concerns about regression in many countries. These concerns have been heightened as governments continue to claim extraordinary powers in the guise of responding to challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and also challenges with violent extremism. So for example, the World Justice Project 2020 Rule of Law Index shows that 65% of Sub-Saharan Africa countries score below the median and there is shrinking space for legal recourse to protect human rights uh, since the dissolution of the South African Development Community Tribunal and the weakening of the African Commission on Human Rights, uh, Human and People's Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, amongst the challenges to governance in Africa is also the lack of access to information and data. Both the AU's Agenda 2063 and the UN Sustainable Development Goals share citizens-centered approaches to governance. However, this is challenged by declining coverage, quality, and frequency of publicly available data for key data cat categories in Africa. Now, coupled with this, there is a lack of awareness and visibility of the AGP agenda and efforts to promote it. Civil society organizations often face challenges in assessing information about the African Union platforms and processes. Compliance to AGP protocols is also inhibited by a lack of transparency and access to information. Now, this project and its planned activities seek to tackle these impediments to CSO action and the AGP success in pursuit of its agenda. The project, led by Afrobarometer, together with four other institutions, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, the Institute for Development Studies, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, and, Law, and the Laws Africa, seeks to strengthen the implementation of the Africa Governance Program on democracy, governance, and human rights agenda. The project seeks to promote 
database advocacy and engagement among Pan-African civil society organizations and the AGP members. Through the Afrobarometer surveys, the D4GA project will produce data on African citizens' perception on a number of good governance issues, including human rights, women and youth rights, corruption, security, among others. Among the various implementation strategies is this meeting, physical meeting, first stakeholder engagements on governance, democracy, and human rights in Africa, also being organized in the three zones, as mentioned earlier. This program aims to strengthen the relationship between the Pan-African CSO and the AGP platform members by creating that platform for engagement among them and build capacity for CSOs to access and efficiently use um, data for advocacy on governance, democracy, and human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, CDD Ghana, together with over 30 CSOs in West Africa, just launched a transnational platform known as the West Africa Democracy Solidarity Network just last Thursday. Now, WADIMOS, as it's known for short, seeks to mobilize pro democracy CSOs and civic groups to counter democracy backsliding. The staff of WADIMOS Secretariat are here to increase their knowledge and acquire additional skills to support CSOs to work together to defend and promote democratic development in Africa. So I am very optimistic that we are already on our way to achieving our objective for this convening and that of the G4GA. On this note, I extend a heartfelt appreciation to all participants on behalf of the consortium members for making time for this event. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the general support of the European Union, which made this convening possible. And I therefore implore everyone present here to participate in the program with your questions and your submissions and your engagement. Thank you very well. Thank you, Dr. Kojo. And uh, <clears throat> if uh, you have a program, there's a slight shift there. Uh, it's written uh, Webster Zambara to talk about uh, data uh, about data for governance alliance. We have shifted it. It's not me who is going to do it. Instead, it is my friend uh, Paul uh, Menza who is going to do that, and then we will move on to receive uh, to to have the keynote address soon after. Thank you. Good morning. And as Vesta said, I will stand on the existing protocols as established by Dr. Santi. I hope Joe is going to project uh, this thing for me. So uh, for the benefit of our media colleagues here, I'm going to go through a brief objective of the project, uh, consult your members and their background, and also what we seek to achieve uh, within the four years that the project will be implemented. Um, as uh, Vesta said, and Dr. Asante hinted, uh, it's a four-year project that will solely be based on uh, data to inform our engagements uh, with our citizens, our governments, various governments in African countries, and also especially with the Africa government's or, uh, architecture, the organizations under uh, the AU. Uh, we started a project from 2021, and we expected to end in 2024. These are the consortium members. Uh, our lead organization is the Afrobarometer. Uh, it coordinates all the other four organizations uh, in the consortium. Uh, in West Africa, we have Ghana Center for Democratic Development managing our interests in West Africa country. Uh, we have the Institute for Demo uh, Development Studies in Kenya. We have Los Africa and IGR, that's the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, both from the South Africa. 
So uh, in brief, these are the organizations that we are working with. The African Union has 19 organs. Out of the 19, our projects have selected nine uh, with special interests in some of the issues that pertain to Africa and the challenges we face. So we, we're working with the African Court on Human and People's Rights, the APRM, uh, we're working with the NEPAD, the ECOSOC, the AU Peace and Security Council, the African uh, Commission on Human and People's Rights, uh, the African Commission of Experts of the Rights of Welfare of the Child, Pan-African Parliaments, and the AU Advisory Board on Corruption. So these are the institutions, uh, the nine institutions of the 19 AU organs we are working with. Uh, the institutions who are coordinating these are CDD Ghana, uh, IDS, and the uh, IJR. In addition to the core AU organs, we are also working with 15 CSOs for now, uh, because the project is a five-year, a four-year project. As we go ahead, we may expand uh, our partnership with other civil society organizations. But for now, we are working with uh, 15 of them, uh, selected from East, West, and Southern Africa for this first year. So in West Africa, these are the organizations we are working with. The West African Network for Peace Building, uh, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa, the Media Foundation for West Africa, and Parliamentary Network Africa. It's four of them are based in Ghana. It's only the uh, Human Rights and Development in Africa that is based in the Gambia. And as I said, uh, it's coordinated by CDD Ghana. When you go to East Africa, I also have uh, five CSOs who are core partners in the project. The Eastern Africa Child Rights Network, Human Rights Watch, the Eastern Africa Civil Society Organizations Forum, Life and Peace Institute, Horn on Africa Regional Program Hub, and Plan International African Union Liaison Office. So these are also the five uh, organizations being coordinated by IDS uh, based in the University of Nairobi. In South Africa, we have the Democracy Development Program. Uh, we have the CDD Mozambique, Democracy Works Foundation, Good Governance Africa, the Institute for Public Policy Research, and is coordinated by the IGR. And overall, our coordinator is Afro Barumita and also leads our data collection and analysis and also all training programs under the projects. We have a special project as part of these activities to source and digitize all AU documents, uh, readable versions, uh, and create a website for it. And that is coordinated by Laws Africa, uh, based in South Africa. There's uh, a developed communication plan from year one to the year four. And uh, that will seek to coordinate all advocacy and uh, making public all our production from the projects, analysis that we'll make from the Afrobarometer data. And that's will be done by all partners involved our civil society partners, the AU organs, and also the coordinators. The key activities outlined under the projects. First is our data collection. The project is informed by data. So we have planned to uh, include specific questions in Afrobarometer rounds 9 and 10 that pertain to mandates of the uh, African uh, Union organs. That for example, we have questions on the governance, corruption, rule of law, environmental governance, gender equality, security, welfare, and others. These are specific questions that relate to the mandate of the nine uh, AU organs that we'll be working with. Then we'll do analysis to produce uh, uh, policy briefs, scorecards on all of these things, and that will inform uh, the capacity building of our CSOs who will use the data to engage with the AG and their various governments. We also have something we call information clearing house. So we'll create an online information that will source and digitize all AU protocols, including laws, court decisions, and other things that will be uploaded online for people to access and use. There we we'll also have uh, yearly scorecards that will be produced assessing conformity to the implementation of AGA protocols. And that all those things will also be made available to our CEO partners to inform the advocacy. 
one of the things that will be happening is what we are doing today. We will offer workshops training and uh, capacity enhancement workshop for our CSO partners to be able to assess, analyze, and use the new data that will be generated through the Afrobarometer uh, rounds 9 and 10 surveys. Then we will have to create a platform that will bring our civil society partners together with the AGA organs, the nine AGA organs, to interact, share ideas, and see how we promote uh, the mandate of the other organs to ensure that we achieve our program for enhancing democracy, governance, and human rights uh, on the continent. What do we seek to achieve with all these things? The project seeks to strengthen efforts to implement AG agenda. That's our main focus. How do we make sure that African citizens get to know the mandate of the various AG, uh, AGA organs? And how do we promote its implementation? How do we internalize the decisions that the organs will be uh, coming up with in our various countries? So based on that, we'll be generating evidence uh, of citizens' perception and demand for the agenda's priorities. So what do citizens want? Through the Afrobarometer uh, survey, we'll be able to have some of these things priorities and we'll make them known to the public. We will be gathering issues and implementing issues relating to the aspirations spelled out in the African Agenda 2063, especially those that border on security, human rights, child and women welfare. We enhance stronger collaboration with CSOs that help coordinate citizens' input and actions. We will build a cadre of CSOs in Africa who will spearhead the, the demands and also the aspirations of the African citizens together in engaging with the uh, AGA organs. And through that, we seek to address some of the challenges that we see in the implementation of the protocols. And also try to widen our network. Now we are working with only 15 CSOs, but before the end of the project in 2024, we seek to have a wider coverage. In our first interaction online, people were asking when we were going to Central Africa and other African uh, regions. But we seek to do that as we go ahead cutting across language, policies, and politics across the African continent. So this is, in short, uh, the project is priority areas and activities aligned to achieve our objectives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. You actually answered a very big question that uh, always lingers as to why 15 organizations in a continent of 1.2 billion people. So at least by 2024, we want to see how many organizations will be added there. And the uh, key probably in this is uh, the, 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 the creation of this new broad platform between civil society in different regional economic communities to, to, to work with the African Union, especially the nine commissions that have been identified. Uh, at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite uh, Professor Jima, who is going to give us a keynote address. And um, I would not be the person to invite him specifically because his CV is very huge. I am so excited that finally I am uh, going to hear him directly because I follow his work and uh, we follow his work globally. Prof, uh, with all due respect, we are all yours for the morning. Thank you. A round of uh, applause to welcome Professor. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I come with great pleasure to offer you warm greetings um, on behalf of the Afrobarometer Board and Management and Afrobarometer Partners in uh, 35 countries where we are represented. 
it is deeply, deeply gratifying to me and to the Afrobarometer family to be part of and indeed enjoy the privilege of playing a lead role in this Pan-African Civil Society Initiative, the Data for Governance Alliance. We are pleased to be associated with the African Union and its allied bodies in prioritizing African an African citizen-centered approach to governance and indeed to help in the promotion of public awareness and visibility of this important agenda. More specifically, I hope and pray that my keynote remarks this morning basically focused on sharing with you insights from the Afro from Afrobarometer surveys on the state of democratic governance in Africa does provide some validation of the concept behind this initiative. And the concept is that data-based advocacy and engagement between Pan-African CSOs and members and structures of the African Union, as well as other Africa interstate actor platforms can help to significantly advance the African Union's Agenda 2063 and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me go on to the main part of my assignment, which was to share with you some sense, some insights about the state of democratic governance in Africa, especially from the perspectives of citizens, of ordinary citizens. I begin with some general remarks and observations about the state of governance on the continent. And as we all recognize, Africa has recorded several significant democratic milestones in at, at least in recent months. So for instance, in Kenya, we've been witnesses to presidential power being transferred smoothly just two weeks ago from Uhuru Kenyatta to William Ruto. And then, the, and this had taken place after a very highly competitive but peaceful presidential election uh, followed by court litigation against the results announced by the Electoral Commission uh, of that country. We also note that Angola held its second, second only transition tra elections also in the month of August. And even though the incumbent party retained power, the opposition recorded significant electoral gains. And also, as many observers have noted, this election saw the emergence in the forefront of democratic politics in Angola, civil society, and non-state actors. But that's, to some extent, as far as the good news goes. On the whole, Africa's two-decade journey towards democracy and accountable governance has been running into terrifying headwinds. We are seeing multiple signs of retrogression and backsliding across the continent. Even in countries previously deemed to be on track to democratic consolidation, such as Benin, Ghana, Senegal, and South Africa. Indeed, Freedom House has downgraded Benin, which has enjoyed a ranking as completely free from almost from the beginning of its democratic transition until recently. Senegal, too, has been recently downgraded. Ghana remains in the category of free on the Freedom House rankings, but only God knows how long Ghana will stay there. So let's look at some of the main areas of threat and deficit 
on the democratic governance front in African countries. We note that elections are being regularly held, but their overall quality is declining. Thanks to voter intimidation and electoral violence in some cases, and also we know that elections are increasingly likely to result in the retention of power by the incumbents, where the incumbents are running. Again, thanks to vote buying and other forms of electoral manipulation. Also, the quality of elections in Africa in, in particular and democratic governance in general is being severely compromised just about everywhere on the continent thanks to escalating costs, cost and monetization of politics and of election campaigns. In the absence of credible regulation of party and candidate financing, together with lax to zero enforcement of the few regulations that may exist, parties and candidates are enjoying practically unfettered access to funding from a range of illicit financiers who, of course, expect payback. Across the African continent, the elite, the political class, particularly incumbent leaders, parties, and their allies in the state bureaucracy, private sector, civil society, and the media, have tended to capture the state and its democratic institutions and processes. This, of course, enables elites to appropriate to themselves the dividends of both democracy and socioeconomic development. State capture is a key reason for the persistence of poverty, inequality, and joblessness, as well as wide gaps in the delivery of education, healthcare, infrastructure, and other state services, irrespective of macroeconomic growth, irrespective of external aid, irrespective of domestic revenue mobilization, irrespective of investments in public service, services and infrastructure, you still end up getting very little because resources that are mobilized on behalf of the state and deployed into these projects invariably end in the pocket of privileged political and state elites. Elite democracy capture also or has enabled political leaders to get away with gross corruption, impunity, low levels of trust, and unresponsive governance. And of course, all of this has been causing loss of faith in the status quo multi-party democratic order in many of our countries. Where still, we are seeing a resurgence of the military coup as a means of changing governments, with West Africa recording four successful ones, uh, Burkina Faso, two in Mali, and then one in Guinea, as well as two failed attempts in Guinea-Bissau and Niger in roughly two years. Then we also have the monster of quasi-constitutional th third termism, the controversial practice of democratically elected heads of state changing or reinterpreting the constitution that brought them to power to allow them to stay past the original term limit. This too is becoming commonplace. And according to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, there have been 22 African rulers who have tried to remove or modify term limits since 2015. But this is all the kind of um, observation, these are the kinds of um, notes that come from the likes of us who sit on top of the mountain or who sit at the bottom of the mountain and then uh, make these grand pronouncements. 
Uh, but we also happen to have the view from the grassroots. And that is what we get from Afrobarometer. So you may ask the question, why are some of us so sure that these counter tendencies, democratic tendencies and trends don't sit well with the African, with citizens across the continent? How can some of us authoritatively say that incumbent presidents are typically lying when they fiddle with their constitutions to extend their tenure in, in office, claiming to be doing so in response to so-called popular pressure? And then how do we, for instance, know that even though citizens in a particular country may give, may welcome military coups. That should not be taken to mean that they do like to be governed under military governments. Are we so sure? And how do we know that citizens across the African continent, for the most part, aspire to live under governments that are democratic, accountable, and responsive, and that these expectations are not being realized. We know that from two main sources. First, we know that just by observation, by looking around and seeing that across Africa, actions in the media, especially social media, actions in the courts and in the streets, speak eloquently of citizens' quest and desire for democracy, accountable governance, and an end to official corruption, impunity, and abuse of power. We saw a dramatic example of this in the protest in Nigeria, including night vigils by thousands of people, mainly young people, at the Lekito booth in Lagos and other cities of southern Nigeria for a whole two weeks in October uh, 2020. And away from the streets, countless activists, journalists, opposition leaders, ordinary citizens, and some, even some state officials have come to represent something like an anti-authoritarian and pro-accountable governance resistance bureau. In their resistance bureau, in, in their individual capacities and as groups, members of this resistance bureau have been registering their disapproval of corrupt officials and have been demanding accountability and speaking truth to power through a variety of means. Last week, for instance, we witnessed and um, the, 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 some of the introductory speeches highlighted this. We witnessed the launch of the West Africa Democracy Solidarity Network in Accra uh, aimed at mobilizing the collective power of pro-democracy actors and resources to advocate for democracy in West Africa and to counter autocratization trends. I sort of opportunistically cite this, but knowing and suspecting that there are similar developments in all of our regions which speak to the fact that ordinary citizens are taking actions to defend themselves, to protect the gains of democracy, to, avoid, to, to counter backsliding and the like. And this is a sign, this is another way of saying that ordinary citizens don't like the kind of situation in which they find themselves with respect to governance, with respect to democracy, with respect to government accountability. We also note that there are all kinds of foot soldiers at work in, in, this, in, in, this, in this area of protecting democracy and preventing backsliding and fighting against official abuse. You will find them across the continent in the guise of cartoonists, satirists, 
very acerbic social and political commentators, some musicians, some filmmakers, gender activists, human rights crusaders, anti-corruption crusaders, investigative journalists, and even some very brave public officials. These, to me, are the sorts of activists who you also saw at work in mobilizing and organizing massive street protests in Guinea and Togo and Cote d'Ivoire against the incumbent president's third term bids and against security agency human rights abuses at the Lake Ito booth that I have mentioned already. But secondly, and even more scientifically, from our standpoint, you know about the preference of ordinary Africans for democracy and accountable governance from Afrobarometer survey findings. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you highlights of Afrobarometer findings that basically confirm and, and affirm the fact that Africans, for the most part, support, expect, and aspire to be governed under governments that are democratic and accountable and responsive. We bring you findings from Afrobarometer surveys spanning over two decades, and by now having covered over close to, sorry, close to 40 countries and indeed 80% of the continent's adult population. These, this data enables us to authoritatively affirm the following. First, that Africans prefer to live in a, political or, in a democratic political order, and that in the latest round of this Afrobarometer service conducted in 34 countries, between 2019 and 2021, seven in 10 citizens said, quote, democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. Eight in 10 rejected one, per one person rule or strongman rule. Three fourths or more rejected one party rule and military rule. And it's also important to note here that military rule was rejected even in many of the countries rocked by recent military coups. And in the last survey, Burkina Faso, for instance, that has experienced a military coup uh, where there was um, street demonstrations in favor of the coup support for military, coup, military regime was just half of the population. The other half rejected it firmly. Equally important is the fact that Africans are broadly committed to the core institutions and norms of democracy. So we find in the same survey, that's around eight, that three-fourths of respondents said they favor limiting their president's tenure to two terms. This is a kind of finding that leads us to conclude that anywhere, anywhere in Africa where you see a leader saying that my people really want me to continue, we know it's a lie. Because even in countries that don't have two term limit, the term limit provisions in their constitution, you still get a majority saying that they support two term. Um, the last time I checked, the average was about 60%. So for that, on that score, we know that there is no African leader that is to be believed if he or she says, I'm staying on because the people want it. Similarly, three fourths of the respondents say they support the ballot box. They want to see the ballot box as the sole legitimate method for choosing their leaders. And a similar 
proportion of our respondents also said they want the president to comply with decisions of the courts, even if the president finds the decision disagreeable. Again, clear majorities, at least six in 10, expressed a preference for, parli for parliament to oversight the executive and expressed a preference for multi-party competition and expressed a, a preference for free media. Even more impressive from at least where I sit, Africans say they would rather have a government that is accountable to the people, even if that means that government makes decisions more slowly, even if it slows down government decision making. And they prefer this over a government that is effective but not accountable. It is even and perhaps equally, not even, but equally noteworthy that popular support for democracy and accountable governance in Africa on the whole, on the average, has remained consistent across several indicate, indicators, and in some cases, support has increased, has firmed up over time. So across 30 countries that Afrobarometer Afro has surveyed consistently over the past decade, Subscription to the ideal of limiting presidential tenure to a maximum of two term limits has remained consistently high at an average of 75%. It's, it's not only that in 2011, 75% of Africa, adult Africans on the average said they support term limits. That has remained so throughout, uh, that's uh, from 2011 uh, to date. And we also note that the expression of preference for a government that is accountable over one that is not accountable, even if it is effective, has increased by 10 percentage points in over the past 10 years. So more and more Africans are expressing stronger commitment to having accountable governance having a government that accounts to the people rather than not. So again, if somebody were to say that, well, Africans have been uh, feeling disappointed about democracy, democratic governance, they want something else, these findings basically debunk all of that. That, yes, people may not be uh, happy with what they have, but it doesn't mean that they don't want democracy or they don't want accountable governance. And again, here is why, how we know this. Thanks to Afrobarometer data, we know that in many countries and across many indicators, popular aspirations for democracy and accountable governance are not being met. They are going unrequited. And that again, across 30 countries that we have tracked for the past decade, only a slim majority report that their country is a full democracy or a democracy with minor problems. This has remained roughly the same over a 10-year period. That is to say, satisfaction, support, a perception that our country is democratic has remained stagnant. They are not seeing progress in that area. When it comes to satisfaction with the way democracy actually works in a country, there has been a significant drop from 50% of the respondents saying that they were satisfied with the way democracy works in their country to 10 years ago, and 10 years later, it, it is 43% of the population. So when it comes to satisfaction with the way democracy works, there has been a decidedly there has been a decided decline of, of that perception. People don't think they, are, they like the way democracy is working in their country. It's not working the way they expect it to, work, to be working. And then also, in 34 countries surveyed in the last round of the survey, for which we have full data, that's 20, uh, 20, 2021, 
six in ten respondents reported that corruption in their country has increased over the past year. And an even larger percentage, higher percentage, say that their government is doing a poor job of controlling corruption. Indeed, eight in ten of our respondents say that at least some MPs and officials at the presidency are corrupt. And half of the respondents say that they only tr they trust the president somewhat or a, le a lot. In fact, trust levels in our elected officials have been declining over time. Similarly, about six in 10 of our respondents said officials who commit crime often or always go unpunished. And very large majorities said members of parliament and local government councillors only sometimes or never listen to what ordinary people have to say. So hopefully this gives you a sense of the view from the grassroots with respect to the state of democracy and accountable governance on, our, on, our, on the continent. So with this, I want to make a few concluding remarks. And first is to express the hope that uh, my, this presentation has somewhat convinced you that the average adult African prefers a government that is democratic and accountable. And two, that the African Union and the substructures, the UN, the European Union, and others, by co you know, the commitment that they have to work in to strengthen democratic, accountable, and responsive governance in Africa, is in alignment, it's in perfectly aligned, uh, it perfectly aligns with the preferences and aspirations of ordinary citizens across the continent. So they should hold fast. They should do it. They should do more. And finally, when it comes to the deployment of empirical evidence in the service of the African Union's Agenda 2023 and others, policy making and other policy making and implementation directed at building democracy, accountable governance across the continent, then forging a close partnership between the African Union organs, its allied bodies, and non-state actors, civil society, research think tanks, academia, advocacy groups, such as the Afrobarometer and others, is a good thing. I hope I've been able to begin to uh, show you that we are generally on a good path, and we should continue and um, stay stay that la you know stay in that lane. With that, let me thank you once again for the privilege of addressing you this morning, and to wish you a most productive workshop and most fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Another round of applause, please. <laughs> thank you. Um, on the program, you will not see that there will be a question and answer session or a response. But uh, you don't let Professor Jima go when you have him. Because this is a lecture that uh, you would expect to get, to get when you go to these top universities, business schools, and whatever, you name them. I want to take this time to give this audience, Prof, a chance to check with you uh, and ask you one or two questions. And uh, the, the data that you have just shared with us, uh, you started on a positive note, of course, uh, on Kenya and uh, Angola. But uh, you quickly said that is how far the road goes. And from then on, we started to get uh, 
a sense that we have got a, a challenge. But within the challenge we are facing as a continent, I think we are excited with the data you have shared that the people on the ground are very clear on what they want. They want good governance. They do not want third termism. They want democracy and they want accountability. And these are things that will grapple us this week and when we meet in Cape Town and also in Kenya to work around it, especially because we link these to the AU Agenda 2063 as well as the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. Given that, Prof, uh, the audience, if there is anyone who wants to seek clarification and ask any uh, question to Professor Jima, this is the chance. After this, Professor Jima will be available for the media uh, 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 who would like to, uh, who may want to interview him separately. But this is a question and answer for all of us who are here. Yes, Doc. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation, uh, Prof. I. <sighs> I think over the last uh, couple of uh, months for me, being in Kenya, um, uh, getting in, being involved with what they must, I, I think it's very clear what citizens want uh, and desire. And it's very clear that citizens are prepared to invest their time, resources, you know, sacrifices, you know, to, to secure democracy. What I'm not sure is about the supply side, our policy makers, our politicians, who used to be, well, they were still citizens, but they used to be, they come from the same places that we come from. Why? They, we don't seem to have Democrats uh, who, in, in terms of just, in terms of their principles and their commitment to uh, democracy, why we don't seem to have enough of those Democrats on the supply side who are kind of meeting the citizens halfway. Every story, I mean, you mentioned the uh, African strategic, uh, 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 Studies uh, um, statistic about the period from 2015 to now where you have as many as 22 African leaders trying to change their constitution to elongate their term. So, what, what's, what's your sense? I mean, ha, has it always, I mean, since the process of democratization, have we always been in this, where the supply side just seems to be just struggling to, to meet the demand side? And going forward, do you see any prospects that you can get closer to a balance? Because without that, it just makes it so hard uh, to secure democracy because of this lopsided balance sheet. Thank you. Any other? One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Gilbert. Um, I have two questions. First one, I want to find out um, if the Afrobarometer um, report did also look at um, the type of parliament we have on the continent and how that affects oversight. Um, secondly, I also want to find out um, whether the citizens are much more happier with the kind of um, electoral systems that we have in place because that also has a way to affect elections. So these are the two questions that I want to, to address. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew from Kenya, and thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that uh, elucidating keynote uh, remarks. I just had one quick question. We tend to view the deficits uh, on democratic governance in a very inward way um, with regards to, as my colleague has raised, the supply side from our leaders, the lack of democratic credentials, or we would question the enlightenment of our electorate. But I just wanted to ask. Um, from your view, 
um, are there external factors that inhibit um, our democratic governance in Africa? And by external factors, I mean some of the international partners, some of the international states uh, that have historically made interventions um, on this continent, recalling the backdrop of the Cold War, recalling the legacies of what it means to invest in extractive industries of, in Africa, and now noting this global conversation that has emerged that was being led by President Biden in, in terms of reflecting on the state of democracy uh, in the world. I was just curious, um, how, do you think we've done enough to highlight, document, and call accountability for the external factors that inhibit uh, democracy on the continent? Thank you. May we give him a chance to respond to these three, and then we take the next round. Okay, maybe um, starting with the uh, last question, um, which I find intriguing because, and maybe I will ask for a little bit more clarification so I, I know I understand the question clearly. But um, you, you, I, I think the question is what role uh, do, do external negative external, what negative roles have external factors and actors been playing in Africa's uh, 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 democratic challenges at the, dom at the domestic level? Um, in, if this was a different lecture, there's a whole lot to be said about the external environment and uh, the kinds of negative impact it, it has been having on, on the African democratization project in our respective countries. Uh, but for now, let's assume that um, it's a fact of life, that, and it's, uh, that's it, what it is. Every, just like the human body, you know, you wake up every, every day, there are viruses all over, uh, and uh, bacteria and others affecting you. But if your body is out of shape, or if you don't sleep well, or whatever, uh, or if you may you may get attacked and you may fall sick. So we take external negative external factors and actors as a fact of life. No actor, no nothing in the world is uh, completely protected from all external uh, problems, and that all you have to deal with is your internal issues. Uh, the world is never structured like that. So I think we probably, instead of worrying too much about what external actors have been doing to us and making it difficult for our democratic projects to succeed, I think it's better for all of us if we assume that uh, maybe nobody outside wants Africa to succeed democratically and be well governed. Operate from that exam from that assumption and uh, build on our protections. And in fact, when it comes to that, what it tells me is that civil society and ordinary citizens are principally the ones to take care of, to, to take care of themselves. Uh, because you cannot leave it to the governments that you have installed to govern democratically, to govern accountably. Uh, if you make that assumption, uh, you are in for a big trouble. You can't also assume that uh, great things will happen to you from external actors. That will also be a naive assumption. A more realistic one is to assume you are on your own in this world and that you stand or fall on, according to what you do and how much you are willing to invest in your own survival and well-being. At least that's my philosophy of life. And I believe it's a sensible philosophy of life since I've lived long and prospered. The, on the, 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 the question about the elections, it's really a question of, you know, so it's about the quality of elections. And we know from the Afrobarometer that increasingly citizens are not happy with the quality of elections. So in fact, it has caused support for election, the ballot box as the mechanism for changing government to drop over a 10-year period. It is still high. It is still 
um, 7 in 10, but it used to be about 8 in 10. It used to be about you know, 8 and a half, I mean, 7 and a half in 10, but it's dropped, suggesting that people are unhappy, and in fact, the top part of the data shows that citizens are unhappy with the tendency for elections to be violent, they are unhappy with the tendency for elections to be rigged, and so on. But just that, on the whole, they still prefer to elect their government through the ballot box than through any other mechanism. The supply gap, the democracy and accountable governance supply gap looked at in ter in over the long horizon, look looked at in terms of, let's say, the 30-year or 20-year period. Yes, there is and this is my, my reading, and may be totally wrong, but there was a sense that in the 2000s, there was general, the, the trajectory of democratic politics, democratization in, in Africa was more upward. It was more positive, things were moving up. I think we have hit, we've been hit, we've hit a rough patch since about uh, the mid-2010s. And that since that time, instead of seeing a continuously upward trajectory, we are seeing dips and rises in some cases, but in general, we are seeing more dip. Which then brings up the question, are we, about, are we on a path to, are we basically returning to our very bad past? And this is where Initiatives like this are important because to look back to what I said earlier, African civil societies, African non-state actors, those of us who don't hold power and authority, are the, it's left to us to try and fight back and to hold the line and to prevent more democratic backsliding because it's in the nature of power holders that without check, they will be indulgent without check. They will be abusive. And that is our job to make sure that that abuse, that indulgence doesn't take place or it doesn't overwhelm us. That, unfortunately, is a task that we have nowhere to turn to and nobody to, to assign to. It's ourselves. It's our civil society. And so I applaud all of you who are taking on that task my only advice and suggestion to you is that it's not going to be easy, so you better brace yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And uh, the challenge, you are, you, you are very clear that uh, it is our role as civil society to stop this uh, democratic recidivism that we are witnessing on the continent. Otherwise, it's none but ourselves. The next round of questions can come through now. I had questions from my left side. I want to believe that uh, uh, some intellectual tingling has happened on the right side of my hand as well. That could... Uh, 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 okay, I see a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please uh, do me a favor, since uh, for my education, if you can introduce yourself so I, 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 I get to know you a little bit. OK. Um, so my name is Festus Kofi Obin. I work with the uh, WANEP as a head of research and capacity building. I was also in your class about 17 years ago in oh, Lagos. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the lecture actually reminds me of some of the good times we had with you was, um, in Legon. Yeah, Prof, my question relates to um, the regional bodies in Africa. Uh, if you look at the sub-regional level and also the continental level, we have um, protocols and conventions against unconstitutional changes of, of government. And um, most of these um, protocols actually are against 
the changing of term limit and all that. I want to find out from you, um, in, in your view, how has the actions and inactions of ECOWAS, African Union, I mean, contributed to this uh, problem? Because we saw a similar thing happening in Rwanda, in Cote d'Ivoire, and also Gambia. And the responses were inconsistent. And so how has the actions and inactions of these bodies also contributed to the problem mm -hmm. uh, we see today? Thank you. Prof, my name is Sixtus. I'm a journalist. Uh, once Festus asked a question, Sixtus decided to also follow up and maybe uh, directly in line with that. I, I want to be a bit more brutal with my question. The ECOWAS particularly has been accused of um, inaction, uh, only holding meetings, talk shops and all of that and we see nothing whatsoever they, they have done, ECOWAS has done at the heads of state's level to deal with uh, coup d'etats within the sub-region particularly. And, and uh, generalizing it to instability. Do you think that as a sub-region, the body that we have has been effective, it has, it has exerted its authority in dealing with intrusions in democratic processes, or you think that um, there was really nothing that ECOWAS could have done? Moderator, can I respond to this? Because uh, when the questions pile up, plenty okay. like that, uh, my, my brain gets overloaded. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, so, but thankfully, the two questions uh, are they, they go together about the uh, the wrecks and uh, Festus, F Festus one. I was going to say until uh, Festus two spoke. I was going to say that well, you singled out um, ECOWAS, but actually ECOWAS has done perhaps the most in uh, trying to counter uh, unconstitutional changes in government, trying to uh, impose and enforce. Uh, compliance with democratic norms in the sub-region. Uh, but, of course, the effort has faltered. I think we, 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 should, um, we should note and applaud ECOWAS for having almost established a record as the most uh, democratic governance, um, enthusiastic promoter of democratic governance among the wrecks of Africa. Um, that in the 2000s, it's, it's ECOWAS worked together to uh, checkmate Charles Taylor in Liberia, uh, checkmate for the Sanko and Co in Sierra Leone, even checkmate Fawe, Yadema, uh, Yadema Fawe when he wanted to simply continue from where his father, his late father, left off and so on. They insisted, you must hold elections. Um, ECOWAS intervened again in uh, Burkina and elsewhere, so we, we, we shouldn't take that away from them. We should rather recognize that and say that because you have achieved that record before, you are at least, in theory, capable of achieving that, and that the blame should be placed on the current leaders of ECOWAS. When uh, the uh, Kufuos and your passengers were there. ECOWAS was more proactive in addressing threats to unconstitutional, you know, to, to democracy in their member countries. It's the current crop of ECOWAS leadership that has not been so strong. Uh, and maybe we should remind them. I also wanted to say, in response to uh, uh, my, 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 my friend on the, the other festivals, that I think we as citizens, as voters, have also been lax. There's an ECOWAS parliament. There, is, there are ECOWAS representatives from our respective legislators 
to that parliament, I understand it's a, it's a, very, it's a highly sought after uh, posting. So they become double parliamentarians, the parliamentarian MP in Ghana, MP in uh, at the ECOWAS level and so on. For all of that investment, we have to be interested in what is it that they can show for that? What do we get out of that? So, in fact, instead of blaming, rather than blame only presidents and so on, we should also be asking the same question of our ECOWAS uh, MPs, the MPs from our own countries who are representing us at the ECOWAS parliament level and so on. And that the other wrecks were just beginning to take notice of ECOWAS's success when ECOWAS itself began to falter and basically drop its leadership on this very important, in this very important area. So what the two of you and myself are basically saying and, and trying to convey is that we want to see an ECOWAS as well as the other regional economic communities active in defending and in protecting and defending democracy from backsliding and from retreat. Thank you. We are about to close. Uh, my sister has got a question, and I think it's only fair that uh, we allow her, and uh, then you'll be the last, my brother. Talking of Echo as prof, when we were growing up and uh, things were getting bad in Sajak, particularly in Zimbabwe, we would even shout that if it was an Echoas, Mugabe would have gone. If it was Echoas, things wouldn't be like this. But now, mm, it's different. The Echoas has taken the cue of its fellow Rex, uh, like Sajak and the East African community, to see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil time, yesterday. Thank you. My sister can go ahead. Yeah. Um, good morning, um, Prof. My name is Zubaida. I'm a journalist. Um, Prof, I have a difficulty um, pertaining to the bar Afrobarometer data you just gave us. Now, my question is that how do we strike the balance between citizens wanting to elect their leaders by the ballot box and the same citizens being wary about the effectiveness of the same system and then its um, impact. So we don't think that we want military uh, uh, or dictatorship and all that. However, we think that the same system we have used to elect our leaders it's not effective. How do we strike the balance between these two? Thank you. Thanks, my brother. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Osekufo. I work with CDD Ghana. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, my question has to do with what other concerns are citizens raising about the practice of democracy in Africa? Uh, there is overwhelming support for democracy, but you also mentioned that there are concerns citizens have been raising around issues of corruption, trust issues, and the lack of sanctions against officers involved in corruption or other abusive practices. I want to find out what other concerns are they raising in terms of how inclusive our democracy is. Because there is a conversation around making our, Af our democracy much more African. But the African, African system of living or, or practice of living is very communal, it's very inclusive, it's very engaging. But the concern is that democracy is bringing a lot of polarization and divisions. Are uh, there views around it or what are your uh, personal experiences regarding this? Thank you very much. Well, the, Paul, the only challenge with your question is you said is African societies are inclusive. Uh, I would correct you to say used to be because that's long ago African society we are talking about. That's African societies that were inclusive to the extent that uh, kinship defined it and that those who fall out of the kinship area, you know, arena were declared 
seen as outsiders. None of us has the luxury of living in those kinds of communities anymore. You've got to live and work in the same country with fellow citizens, regardless of which ethnic group or which um, religion they subscribe to or whatever and so on. So you're talking of universal citizenship. And when it comes to universal citizenship or a concept of universal citizenship rights and so on, uh, you can't take a communitarian society that far. So a bit and to base, I also come to my sister's question. What that also tells you is that election as the being to choose leaders is obviously an artificial thing. It's, uh, it's synthetic, it's not organic. It's not natural that uh, the, you, you cast ballot and you elect the wisest leaders. So it's just that there's no, it's, it's totally convenient. It's just an item, a practice of convenience, and that there is no, nobody, to my knowledge, uh, what I know so far, has come up with an alternative way of choosing leaders who will always be wise, who will always be strong, and who will govern fairly and inclusively, and so on. So we have this artifact called election. I think where the problem is is that it's got it, it's got uh, to be improved. It's got to be called, it has to be of high quality. It means meaning that it has to be honest. It has to be not rigged. It has to be non-violent and so on. But these are tasks that we, we, we have to perform. So those who do election watchdog stuff, they understand that um, you know, this is competition. People, competitors, contestants would like to, uh, to, to cheat and uh, gain an advantage over each other. So your job is to watch and make it difficult for that sort of uh, cheating and stealing and rigging to occur. Uh, you, it's, I think it's easier never to assume that um, the ideal prevails. We rather have to work to make ideal, the ideal happen. Electors, elections um, may not be perfect. They may have problems, but yes, we don't have a solution have an alternative to elections. So we have to work to improve the quality of elections. Now, does that mean that sometimes, because elections don't work, people would want military rule, so on? I don't think so. I, I really think what we are seeing when people jump up and they demonstrate in favor of military rule, of a military coup, is that they are happy about the change. They are not happy about, they weren't happy about their situation. Change has come. But that is different from saying that they want military rule. They want military coup. Just go and ask our colleagues in Guinea. In a few, in, in, in less than a year, they started complaining about, coup, about the situation. They are protesting. They are fighting the government. Unfortunately, I'm, and I'm, I hope and I'm sure some of those people who supported the coup by jumping in the streets and uh, celebrating are beginning to regret. It doesn't mean that they were wrong in supporting the coup in the first place because the coup did remove, in my view, from, uh, from very, very far away a uh, president who had become uh, unbearable. But everybody's mistake was to have gone home thinking that once you have a new government, things will be all right. We always have to work. We always have to work. Uh, those of us in Ghana who, who thought uh, we had found a savior uh, have learned better. Thank you. Um, ladies and, and you gentlemen. you will not get me to elaborate on this ever. <laughs> we, we, we will have uh, uh, the members of the media will have a chance to continue to engage Prof. If we are to follow by our program, uh, Prof's keynote address ends now. And uh, once again, I would like to request a big round of applause to Professor Jima.
Thank you. Uh, I am instructed that we will have a group photo now uh, before the prof leaves and then have tea sooner.